Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thank you for joining us from wherever you are. Um, today we're launching um, a great book called Anti-Gender Politics in the Populist Moment. Um, and we have both authors with us today. Uh, we will talk a little bit about uh, who the authors are and who our panelists are in a second. But before that, I, uh, I wanted to start with a few housekeeping rules. Uh, we're being recorded, the event is being recorded. Um, so we just wanted to let everybody know. And the recording will be available on uh, the Democracy Seminar and the Trans Regional Center for Democratic Seminars websites, which are the sponsors of this event, uh, both located at the New School for Social Research in New York. Uh, keep an eye on the chat. Uh, for those in the audience, I will be sharing all the links um, and information about um, the, the centers and about uh, future events. Also, um, in the second part of the event, we'll have a um, Q&A um, section. And for that, you may post all your questions at the bottom of your screen where it says Q&A. And the moderator, who is um, Jeffrey Goldfarb, uh, will take a look at the, at the questions as they come in, and uh, the panelists will address them at this, um, in the second part of the event. OK. Um, now that the housekeeping rules are done, let me introduce. Um, oops, let me introduce the the panelists. So uh, we'll start with the, our authors. Um, Agnieszka Graf is an associate professor at the American Studies Center uh, at the University of Warsaw. Uh, she's a cultural studies scholar with research interest in gender studies, feminist theory, nationalism, and public discourse on gender. Her articles have appeared in Science, East European Politics and Societies, Public Culture, European Journal of Women's Studies, as well as a number of collected volumes. I will also share the full bios in the chat and they're also available on the website. Um, Elizabeth Koralchuk, the um, uh, co-author of this book, is an associate professor in sociology. Um, she works at uh, Soderton University in Stockholm and at the American Studies Center um, at Warsaw. Warsaw University. Her research interests involve social movements, civil society, politics of reproduction, as well as um, right-wing populism and mobilizations against gender. Uh, she co-edited two books on motherhood and fatherhood in Poland and Russia, and published two volumes on social movements and civil society in Central Europe. Um, as I said, the full bios will be available in the chat. Um, because there's so much more to say about <laughs> both these wonderful authors. Um, our panelists today are Eva Fodor and Gaudencio Fidelis. Eva uh, Fodor is professor of gender studies at the Central European University in Vienna and Budapest at CEU. She is a sociologist by training and persuasion and persuasion and has written books and numerous articles on gender, state socialism, post-state socialism, with a focus on gender inequality in the labor market. Her most recent book, uh, 2021, is The Gender Regime of Anti-Liberal Hungary. Um, Gaudencio Fidelis uh, is a curator and art historian. Uh, he holds an MA from the university, um, uh, from New York University and a PhD from <clears throat> in art history from the State University of New York, SUNY Binghamton. And he has organized and curated more than 50 exhibitions and published extensively. Most recently, he curated the exhibition Queer Museum, Cartographies of Difference in Brazilian Art in 2017. And between 2019 and 2021, um, he um, has been fellow of the Institute of International Education, the Scholars Rescue Fund, and a fellow of the New uh, University in Exile Consortium. Um, Finally, the moderator uh, of today's event is Professor Jeffrey Goldfarb. Uh, he is Professor uh, Emeritus of Sociology at the New School for Social Research. And now I will hand it over to Jeff. Thank you everybody again for joining us today. Thank you, Lala, for um, helping making this uh, uh, very important event possible. Uh, your, your intelligence and organizational skill always astounds me. Um, and, and thank you, Elzbieta and Agnieszka, for, uh, for joining us today and for writing this uh, really wonderful book, really interesting book, uh, illuminating book. Um, our plans for um, proceeding is that uh, Elzbieta and Agnieszka are going to give us uh, brief overviews of, uh, 
of the book and uh, uh, to entice, to confirm for, the, for those of us uh, 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 what we've learned and read uh, from reading the book already and to en help entice others to uh, uh, read the book uh, 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 to their benefit. Um, and then the discussants will, uh, th they will speak for about uh, 15 minutes or so. And then, uh, um, and then uh, uh, the discussants will each uh, uh, discuss the book for give their response for about ten minutes each, and then we'll have a general discussion. So uh, I actually don't remember who, which one of you is going to start. Is it Elzbeta? Yes, uh, please uh, proceed. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for organizing this event. And we are always very excited to have these conversations because uh, we really hope that our work speaks not only to those who are interested in Central Eastern Europe or Poland specifically, but also um, we wanted to offer some conceptualizations of the trends that we can see in other parts of Europe and the world. So our basic goal is to show that or show how gender has become a central uh, issue or a central um, uh, struggle in um, in today's politics in today's um, cultural and social uh, debate so um, I, we would like to share the time between us and uh, just show you uh, some uh, show you a presentation because we have some pictures and uh, illustrations of our, uh, our, our um, analysis, which we thought might be fun for you to, uh, to see. So I would like to ask Lala to share, um, share our presentation. And uh, we can, um, as we already know, the, the book is available and it's available um, um, in open access. So you can just download it if, if you would like to. And uh, I would like you. I would like to start with the um, next slide, um, because uh, we wanted to. Of course, we cannot talk about the whole book, so we have chosen four key points, four key ways to conceptualize the issues that we are talking about, that we analyze, that we scrutinize, and uh, one of them is the nature of the relation between anti-gender movement and right-wing populists, um, and uh, we have looked at different organizations. Some of the names you can see here, uh, such as World Congress of Family, which is connected to International Organization of, um, uh, for the Family, um, established in the United States in the 90s. Some of them, such as again, Agenda Europe, uh, are uh, basically um, connected to or are this kind of semi um, semi-open gatherings of key organizations and key um, elite actors gathering people from civil society organizations, uh, political parties, um, um, institutions, and sometimes also business and the aristocracy, um, which cooperate to uh, propose a specific type of political plan and, and uh, cultural and social agenda. And some of them uh, are more um, well, they have a form of social movement such, such as Manif Pourtou, which has emerged in France in response to the plans to make uh, the, um, uh, the uh, marriage equality or actually partnership part of the of the French law. Uh, but if you look at uh, if you look at this kind of long term perspective, you can see how uh, this cooperation, this collaboration between those various civil society groups uh, or representatives of various churches, various um, various uh, religious institutions, has uh, evolved over time. And I we have chosen actually the pictures of uh, Matteo Salvini here, um, uh, leader of uh, uh, of the Italian Lega, and at the time the uh, the leader of uh, uh, the leader of the um, uh, of the Italian state. Uh, here he is in 2019, um, a meeting of the World Congress of Families, wearing this very characteristic t-shirt, uh, which, uh, which proclaims his support for uh, this sort of pro-family um, agenda of the movement. Uh, and, the, uh, and the picture that you can see here is the picture of the leaders 
of uh, World Congress of Families, including Brian Brown, this nice, a nice person next to, to uh, Salvini holding the poster, uh, but also several um, um, activists or activist leaders um, from various organizations in Italy and beyond. And that shows this opportunistic synergy, which is actually a, a dynamic which includes political alliances, ideological affinities, and organizational ties between those two groups. Uh, and on the one hand, you can see that those uh, anti-gender organizations become a cadre of right-wing populists uh, where they are in power, where they need, when they need uh, people who will um, step in to become uh, their partners in, in the Polish case, in Supreme Court or in various intergovernmental bodies. But also uh, there is this emotional or affective um, aspect to this uh, coalition or to this cooperation because the notion of gender um, is used as a way to polarize um, the society and to vilify the elites and to show who are the elites and who are the people. Because of course, elites are always um, uh, portrayed as uh, morally corrupted, evil, and having power, whereas the people are always portrayed as those who are socially conservative, authentic, and locally rooted. Um, and um, it's quite important that although this cooperation, this opportunistic synergy, uh, is uh, at times very uh, tight, I would say, it, it doesn't mean that it's very stable. Um, and it has different uh, um, different um, effects in different contexts. And uh, in Poland, this is a clear example of cooperation between law and justice party and the coalition parties uh, who are in power uh, today and various organizations such as Ordo Juris Institute, which is a key anti-gender um, leader in Poland and also in Europe, I would say, and uh, who, who actually um, um, cooperate closely on uh, uh, on uh, drafting, um, uh, you know, new bills, uh, proposing different types of institutional changes, um, proposing people who who will be sitting in key institutions. For example, the uh, National um, uh, Institute for for Freedom, um, which deals with civil society, state relations, but also in different contexts, in it. it moves uh, through uh, through different uh, regions because uh, as you might know um, the american-based conservative political action conference meeting will take place this year in budapest and the uh, other juris uh, institute has announced its presence already in this uh, at this event and actually it is seen seen or interpreted as a uh, an attempt to forge closer reliance between uh, Orban and uh, and Trump to support Trump's presence in future elections. So basically, um, and the next slide here, uh, one of the key discursive tools which are employed by the movement uh, is the anti-colonial frame, uh, which uh, might be surprising in some contexts, but it's basically a claim that gender mainstreaming reproductive rights uh, anti-discriminatory legislation uh, are a form of cultural colonialism, which is promoted by um, progressive movements, but also by um, institutions such as United Nations and global corporations. Uh, Bill and Melinda Gates are usually the culprits here. Um, and uh, uh, this is, of course, a way to um, to change this relation between the perpetrator and the victim. It's, it's, it allows for the reversal of this relation to show that feminists and LGBTQ community are the fact, in fact, the colonizers, those who incite um, um, violence, uh, especially in the global south and also in um, um, in post-communist region. Um, and this is a specific type of play with uh, affective uh, emotives, we can see, we can say the affective elements of the discourse, because the, the main, um, uh, the main um, message here is that 
Finally, countries such as uh, Poland and also other post-communist countries can stop trying to catch up with the more developed West, but they will be the beacon of hope because they have managed to keep to uh, traditional values that are essentially Western values. So this is a, is a way to draft a new moral geography of Europe in which uh, Poland and Hungary and other countries will be finally the saviors and those that not the ones who are in need of being saved uh, by the West. And that, of course, brings um, a very um, powerful, affective dynamic in which people can finally feel pride uh, or feel proud of the fact that they will be the ones who, who will save um, the West. And I will give the, the floor to Agnieszka now. Thank you, Elżbieta. Um, and I would like to take this opportunity, besides thanking uh, you for hosting us, which is a wonderful moment, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Elżbieta because it just occurred to me that this is our book launch, which means that it's officially over now. Um, we'll have to think of a new project and this has been a really long collaboration. And um, so, yeah, so it's an important moment for us as friends as well uh, as co-authors. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, the, the, the idea that I'm supposed to present to you um, uh, is uh, the idea that led me into um, onto the brink of madness in the summer of 2018. So we're on thin ground here. I spent a lot of time reading um, uh, anti-gender books and um, I was drawn into them. I realized at some point that they're telling a real story, that there's no misunderstanding here, that there might be a form of manipulation here, but that it's also a riveting narrative um, about the history of the world, which uh, can be really seductive for people. So I had my moments of immersion that um, I, I recall now with some trepidation. And I think of this now, and I'm, I'm not sure to what extent this is legible from the book, that what we're really dealing with at its core is a um, conspir conspiracy theory, which has its core version, which, which is really conspiratorial, and which in some uh, respects is also anti-Semitic. And I think Judith, uh, the attacks on Judith Butler um, in Sao Paulo in 2017 were very clearly anti-Semitic. And the fact that Judith Butler is so central to um, anti-genderism is, no, um, um, is no coincidence. But of course, there are also versions that are not um, so obviously um, conspiratorial. In other words, we're dealing with a robust anti-modern worldview, um, uh, which uh, has certain um, elements that seem very rational and very uh, commonsensical. And in fact, one of the ways that this worldview legitimizes itself is through appeals to the common sense. So there are appeals to the family as a value, the idea that um, gender is a threat to children, uh, but there are also appeals uh, to common sense, the idea that um, gender um, is an outrage to what we can all see is true, which is the biological roots of uh, masculinity and femininity. Um, the anti-Semitic aspect of um, anti-genderism is something that um, I've worked on since finishing the book. Mm, and uh, I have been following um, the work and influence um, of a certain E. Michael uh, Jones, uh, who is a kind of shadowy figure um, operating in the United States, a representative of an ultra um, uh, radical conservative um, uh, version of Catholicism and an open anti-Semite. And what I found is that he has very direct influence on some of the key thinkers of the more, much more mainstream version of um, the anti-gender movement. Um, so th this is something that I, I find quite disturbing and interesting in its own right. And um, I think it's it it's, makes sense to see this phenomenon, this uh, declension narrative about the degenerate West, um, which has destroyed itself through, the, through perversion as a new version of an ideology which had enormous influence on um, in late 19th and early 20th century, which is, of course, conspiratorial anti-Semitism. And, and we spent some time in the book looking at the, um, uh, sorry, at the, um, 
similarities between uh, the anti-Semitic idea of the Jew as pervert, as representative of cosmopolitanism, ruthlessness, um, evil, even demonic forces, and uh, the way that gender is discussed in anti-gender discourse. Um, so that's something I wanted to draw your attention to. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, it is, of course, common knowledge that anti-Semitism historically in that version um, was socialism for idiots. I think it's August Bebel that, uh, that said this. Um, our point is not to say that anti-Semitism is merely um, that, that, that the anti-capitalist um, elements of anti-gender movement, which are clearly there, um, are merely a disguise for anti-Semitism, nor do we want to um, completely abstract from the anti-Semitism, which is really there. In other words, it's both. It's anti-modernist, uh, anti-modern, um, and it's anti-neoliberal. Uh, and this, this is basically the, the core point of our book, I think, as I now see it from a certain distance. We believe, as and we're not original in saying this, um, um, Andrea Peto has written this uh, with her co-authors. Um, in, in fact, many authors from Eastern Europe have been uh, willing to point this out, that anti, the anti-gender movement um, is a reactionary response to neoliberalism. In other words, um, the coalitions that uh, are formed and which we call um, uh, an opportunity synergy are not and yet another version of what is observed in the United States since the mid 70s. In other words, the coalitions between uh, neoliberals and religious conservatives, the new right and the neocons. This is something different. It's a different constellation of ideas and groups. Um, this is a movement which actually feeds on people's um, uh, anxieties, problems, existing um, 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 existing problems with that, which are a result of uh, the neoliberal uh, neoliberalization of social uh, policies or the disappearance of social policies in many countries. In other words, um, uh, what anti the anti gender movement offers is a moralistic version of what, in another uh, uttered in another language, the leftist language might be a critique of um, capitalism as it now exists. And Ashbita asked me to make sure that I offer a definition of neoliberalism because I know this is a very contested term, and depending on where you go, people use it or ref or refuse to use it. Um, uh, we use this term to signify both the economic. Um, regime or governance regime, which has been, uh, which originates uh, in the, the, the 70s and which flowered, uh, which, which flourished in the 80s with Reagan and, uh, and Thatcher and is of course associated with this idea that there's no such thing as um, a society, there are only individual families and so on. Um, and and the, um, the well-known um, policies that go with this, uh, with this ideology, which mostly consist in privatization of everything that can be privatized. But we are also interested in the cultural dimension of neoliberalism. In other words, we uh, read following a number of critics, um, uh, of cultural studies critics, as well as sociologists, we, we think of neoliberalism as a cultural paradigm in which uh, economic rationality permeates all spheres of life, um, including uh, family life, including emotions, um, including social life, including education, including the university. Um, uh, and uh, the, the, the fact that this uh, system uh, reigns supreme, that we all think in terms of individualis uh, individualism, in terms of profit and so on, um, has produced enormous anxieties. And these anxieties have resulted in leftist critiques of neoliberalism, but also in ultra conservative um, critiques of neoliberalism. And this is what the uh, anti-gender movement does. And uh, just to give you one example, I love this picture, I must say, mm, the baby in the shopping cart, the middle picture here, it was uh, it was one of the images that is that that were circulated mm, in Italy um, during the um, uh, Verona uh, Congress of Families in 2019, you can see the baby has a barcode. The idea that babies are for sale, uh, 
that changes in kinship systems that are due to the normalization of homosexuality. This baby has two fathers and several mothers, right? It's, uh, the idea is that this is an effect of surrogacy. Mm, this is associated not just with sin, not just with perversion, but also with the spread of market ideologies into the sacred sphere of the family. That is the outrage that the um, anti-gender movement uh, promises to combat. And so it manages to address parents as a target group very effectively because it mobilizes fears around intimacy, around childhood, um, around uh, domestic love and relationships. Um, so that's, that's it from me. Um, I hope that's provocative enough to, to get us talking. Thank you again. So actually, we didn't agree who would be the first commentator. Uh, Eva, would you be willing? Sure, I'm happy to, but I'm also happy to go next if, uh, but Please do. Why, why, why don't I start? Yeah. Um, so thank you, thank you for inviting me. Um, um, I've been following your work for years and uh, it was a real pleasure to read this. I had seen bits and pieces of, uh, of this work before, but to see this in its in its entirety was was really um, extremely interesting and and uh, and sort of put the bits and pieces of the puzzle together. Um, so I'm very grateful that you gave me this opportunity, and I'm really excited to be to be talking about this, particularly because my experience, most of my experience, is uh, from Hungary. I kind of I feel like I live the uh, I, I live this uh, this anti gender context. I live within it. I'm deeply embedded in it in my everyday life. I open the papers, and uh, these images are uh, come right at me. Um, uh, it, the Hungarian government's media publishes an article on gender, uh, following very much the logic that you describe practically every day. So this is sort of an everyday experience to me, and it is really interesting for me to compare what you're writing and um, and what we're finding or what we're seeing in in Hungary. Um, I just want to say that um, this is an excellent book, truly. This is a book launch, so I guess we're, we're, this, we're here to talk about the, the book, not just the ideas, uh, you know, just specific ideas in the book. But I was really, truly impressed by the vast amount of material, empirical material that you collected here. So many examples, so many telling and, and, and tangible and, and clear examples to illustrate the points. Um, the, I, I, but, but at the same time, it's not just a collection of empirical uh, bits and pieces, but it's really clearly tied together in a very coherent argument to make the case. I think this is a very powerful book, and I'm really looking forward to assigning uh, the whole thing or parts of it. I'm really glad it's open access, but I'm certainly going to use it in, in, in class and, and, and teach my students um, uh, about, about these issues. I, I, I have, this is a very clear formulation, I think, uh, that you produced of, of this problem. This is a cultural analysis. I'm, a, I'm an economic sociologist, if anything, but I still enjoyed it. And because um, I thought that the connection between the cultural context or the cultural phenomenon and the economic context within which it takes place is really nicely described and really well connected. So you really connect the struggles of over gender, as you call it, with, uh, with the political economic context of neoliberalism and right-wing populism and the emerging authoritarianism in, 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 in governance regimes. Um, I thought that you explained the concept of gender as a cultural threat and tied it really well and explained how it responds to um, not just the perceived moral crisis, but also um, to, to, to how it's linked to uh, neoliberal welfare policies and sort of economic anxieties and status anxieties coming, you know, derived from the economic crisis and the uh, neoliberal sort of economic scene. So this was one thing that I really liked about the book. Another thing that I really enjoyed was uh, uh, this, um, the, the argument about uh, um, the, the, the construction of the East-West divide that you just uh, also described. And uh, the idea that um, anti-gender discourse is really um, often a conservative discourse on colonization. 
Um, it uses, it is used to produce the division between East and West. And this division, of course, the construction of this distinction is ongoing. It's not, uh, you know, it's not a thing, it's not an objective thing, but it is being constructed as we speak. And it was constructed differently in 1990. It was of course constructed very differently in the 1980s, in the 1990s. And I think the turn it has taken uh, uh, is, is, is completely fascinating. We usually read about um, uh, sort of much of the stuff that I've read about uh, colonization and the second word came from, you know, from, from, the op from the opposite direction. It described how Western European processes of Europeanization is a, is a form of colonization of Eastern, of Eastern Europe and, and the second word. What you're describing is going from the other direction and really highlighting the two sides of the coin together, how these two work together and negotiate and, and uh, sort of balance out and produce something that, that is being constructed in, in everyday discourse. I, I also th I thought that that was something that, that was an argument that goes well beyond the issue of gender and, and the specific political mobilization or, or anti-gender discourse. So the time is short. So let me now focus on one specific chapter, which I, uh, which is closer, the closest to what I'm interested in. And this is chapter five on anxious parents and children in danger. Um, and the argument here is that parenthood serves as a mobilizable political identity for an increasing number of people. And it is one of the core identities of many right-wing anti-gender activists, which, which actually allows them um, uh, to transform these moral panics and, 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 and economic grievances into political action. I thought that was really persuasive. And, um, and I see a lot of this happening in Hungary. So just uh, to illustrate uh, uh, this, um, let me tell you about the upcoming elections, um, which is going to be taking place on the 3rd of April, but the elections is one thing, but the elections are tied to, so simultaneously with the election, a referendum is going to take place. So the government chose to do a referendum on the same day as the election. The referendum is about child protection. And there are four questions and the four questions basically exemplify everything that you describe in the book. Um, so people will be asked to answer the following four questions. I'll read them out and then, uh, because, um, because on the one hand, they're funny. And on the other hand, they're such great illustrations of, uh, of exactly what you describe. The first one is, do you agree that underage school children should receive education about different forms of sexual identity without parental control? So people have to decide whether or not underage children should be exposed to any kind of random sexual propaganda, sexual, random propaganda of sexual nature. But again, focusing on sexual identities. Then the second one is the best. Do you support the popularization of sex change operations to underage children in schools? This is a real question that people will have to answer at the same time as they're voting in or against a new government. And the other the next two are, are very similar. So you see um, all the elements that you describe here, uh, playing on people's emotions, playing on people's fear, you know, de let's defend our children from these, from, 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 from these horrible things that might happen to them. But, at the, and, but and, and of course, constructing the enemy as the homosexual or, or, or gender neutral or gender confused other. But there's another thing, which is that, I mean, you realize that these are idiotic questions. Totally crazy questions. Do you agree that school children should be presented with sexual content on social media without limitations? Now, who would agree with to that? Nobody, right? But by asking this question, what, what the government is doing is that they're they're creating a totally crazy West, like a, 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 a manic West, uh, and normal Hungarians. So every people look at these questions, take it seriously, say, of course. Of course, I, of course I, I do not support the popularization of sex change operations to six year olds in school. If you ask this question, that means that this must be normal elsewhere. So clearly we are here to defend, you know, the, the last remnants of sanity that exists in the world. So this is the emotional impact that, that, that this produces. This is, so what they're trying to say is this is the government that is here to prevent normalcy. So again, gender and, um, and, and arguments about uh, sexuality and gender closely connected to gender um, uh, are used to, uh, to claim political legitimacy, 
used to claim um, political positions and of course are used in the most direct and shameless manner for a political, a simple electoral campaign. Um, the, it, I think that such this is this is the most recent. This is what's going on in Hungary now. Is an excellent illustration of everything that you describe in this uh, in in this chapter. But and this is my last point. I promise. There are also differences between um, family protection measures in Hungary and Poland. And the two of you are, I'm sure, quite familiar with this. The major difference, and I'm going to put this really simply, is that pronatalist measures in Poland are largely egalitarian. So each family gets roughly the same thing. And in Hungary, the opposite is true. There are vast differences in who gets access to what kind of um, um, uh, uh, benefits and allowances, depending on your race and ethnicity and closely connected to, to this class. So race is extremely important in Hungary's um, pro-natalist policies. These policies are eugenic uh, in nature, in every sense of the term, uh, except for being openly, openly racist. But they're not, so they're not directly racist, but in, in, in its impact, uh, they definitely are. I also, so, and, and, and that made me think that if the ultra conservative illiberal family agenda is a response to uh, neoliberal austerity measures and neoliberal ideas which center about the, on the individual and individual success and these anti-gender sort of uh, illiberal, this anti-gender illiberal pro-family agenda replaces this emphasis on the individual with a, a sense of belonging and the community and you know, nationhood. This is really a really persuasive point in your, in your book. But what's happening in Hungary is, is really not that. You see a family policy that does not unite, but actually divides, creates divisions uh, amongst people. So creates divisions to some extent similar to uh, the, uh, sort of, uh, the way divisions are created in you know, you know, the run of the mill neoliberal welfare policies. Just to give you yet another example that's happening right now, um, the Hungarian government has decided to uh, give pandemic relief to, uh, to families with children. So you can get a tax rebate if you, have to, if you are raising children of about 2000 euros. That's a lot of money. That's about twice the average wage in Hungary. This is the maximum amount that you can get, but you can only get it if you make a lot of money. So you need to make a lot of money in order to be able to claim the tax rebate. If you don't make a lot of money, you can still get a little bit of it. The less money you make, the less you get. And if you don't work in the formal labor market, you get nothing at all. It is surprising that, so I, I cannot get over the fact and I don't really understand why and how is it possible that these measures that privilege the rich that clearly give less money to those who need it and give no money to those who need it the most are still politically uh, viable. And in fact, garner political uh, uh, strength to the government. This is what the government uses as its, as its major political agenda. How is that possible? And the answer to how that is possible is um, lies in the fact um, of, uh, lies in the concept of race and ethnic, ethnic differences. Hungary has the largest ethnic uh, uh, minority um, in, well, I don't know, many, of many Central European countries, certainly more than, than, than in Poland. And um, it is this ethnic minority that's primarily, or it's, that is one group that's certainly excluded from uh, the benefits. So the, not only does the government, so the gov, as the government is dividing the population, it's dividing the population to those who don't deserve these benefits and those who do, and those who don't deserve, deserve, deserve the benefit tend to be ethnic minorities or uh, the otherwise poor. So I, so I think race is an important issue here and class, and I need to take this into account as we talk about the anti-gender discourse and the ways in which it's being produced. Because in, in, in countries, so the argument I'm trying to make is that in countries where racial where race is relevant and significant, um, anti-gender discourse and anti-gender ideologies are translated into policy slightly differently than in other types of, than in, than in countries where this is not relevant. I think Hungary and Hungarian uh, pro-natalist sort of policies that, is, that, that are bordering on, on, on eugenics um, is a good example. 
Okay, so I'll stop here. Just in sum, I think this is a great book. I particularly enjoyed the last chapter, which is uh, uh, sort of a forward looking and is uh, more optimistic. Again, coming from Hungary, that begs the question of um, how, what sense you make of countries that do not have uh, any sort of uh, uh, mobilization, uh, in fact, anti gender or not. Um, but uh, so, so it's sort of an explanation of this lack, the lack of mobilization was something that I would be uh, interested in, in hearing from you about. So I'll stop here and thank you again. This has been, this has been a great experience. Thanks. Thank you very much, Eva. Um, um, I'm sure uh, Elzbieta and Agnieszka have, have much to say about this. Uh, they will uh, be able to respond in a few minutes, but before they do so, Wendencio, please uh, uh, offer your comments, uh, uh, which I, suspect are somewhat related, but also are different. Please. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jeffrey. Um, thank you for this um, invitation to speak in this webinar in the company of the authors, uh, Agnieszka Graf and Ilzbieta Kukowski, um, who wrote this timely book, so I'm forgive my pronunciation. Um, who wrote this timely book on such a pressing, pressing issue? Congratulations to the authors um, and to all who work in organizing uh, to organize this event. I believe um, one of the reasons I was invited to speak here today is due to the fact that in mid September 2017, the exhibition I curated on queer titled "Queer Museum: Cartographies of Difference in Brazilian Art." was censored and shut down by the Santander Bank, the host and sponsor of the exhibition of just two and a half days of attacks, perpetrated larger under the umbrella of the so-called gender ideology by right-wing organizations and religions fundamentalist groups. That catastrophic incident for Brazilian art and culture, which triggered a year of intense fight to reopen the exhibition, which eventually happened, was followed by countless others, including one that is mentioned on this book, which were the attacks on the scholar and professor Judith Butler as she arrived in Brazil for a conference. Just a few weeks later, by the very same groups that perpetrated a campaign against the Queer Museum exhibition, and such attacks were once again perpetrated against what they would saw as being motivated by gender ideology propaganda. It was just a few years earlier in 2010 when one of the, the four large scale exhibitions on queer ever organized Arth Omorotica, curated by Pavel Leskovitz, to which the Queer Museum exhibition model owns a great deal, which was hosted by the National Museum in Poland, in Warsaw, was also attacked in similar grounds. Poland's right wing populist movement, which has commonalities with the one growing in Brazil, is, is now largely widespread. I pointed to these events just um, to remind us how widespread anti-gender movements is something this book makes clear. And I would like to call attention to this quote unquote coherent global anti-gender movement as this book highlights pointed to the fact that the struggles in which we are now all engaged against the vicious attacks on reprodu reproductive rights and on the LGBTQ plus rights of freedom of expression and identity and to achieve protection under the law are getting more and more complex every day. I find especially important that as this book discusses the anti-gender movement and its appropriation by right-wing populist global agenda, it has been written under the lenses of a feminist perspective, considering the fact that those engaged in a feminist struggle for democracy and the LGBTQ movement should be unified, at least on this front. It's still rarely the case. So besides acknowledging the enormous, enormous body of knowledge this book provides to the reader, it sees, I see it in many ways as a manifesto, a call for duty, so to speak, when it comes to the understanding of the serious and grave implications of these attacks on gender for a fully democratic society. The many ramifications this has on the exercise of freedom of expression, freedom of speech, academic freedom in the arts, culture and science is extraordinary. 
and of course, disturbing. So I want you to take this opportunity that the launching of this book provides to issue a warning. The same one I have given countless times since 2017 when the Queer Museum exhibition was attacked that we should not be distracted by thinking that this global anti-gender movement, which is indeed coherent, organized, and highly planned, seeks only to exhaust its most basic agenda, the one that is referred on this book and which this book discusses so clearly. It doesn't. It seeks to reach far beyond these goals, to deeply undermine our cognitive abilities of decision-making and free thinking, it triggers the very mechanisms that generate self-censorship to make them function in a way that gradually impairs one's capacity to think adventurously and produce advanced knowledge. This is also a cumulative process. It creates a trap for the mind, something that anyone who cares about the basic values of democracy should be especially concerned with. And I would end by saying that in my perspective, the antidote against such terrifying outcome, which is well underway, can only be a constant 24 seven awareness of, this, of its dangers. Something publications such as this can always play a major role in helping to reach. Thank you and congratulations to all once again. You have to unmute yourself, Jeff. I did, but it didn't stick, but now it has. Okay, thank you very much, Gwendensko, uh, 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 for, for the moving commentary. Um, uh, so, Elzebeta and uh, uh, Agnieszka, do you have any initial um, uh, replies to your commentators? Elzbeta, please. Yeah, maybe I'll give voice to Agnieszka. I was starting the last time, so. Okay, well, thank you for those really generous and moving and informative comments. Um, le let me start by saying that the that we have this eerie feeling that these people have read our book and now they are kind of following it as a set of instructions. For instance, the image of um, a, a petition drive that Ordo Juris is now, uh, has just in the last few days started uh, against colonization through gender. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's like something that we discovered, but we had to do some serious reading between the lines and to see the patterns. It, I don't think we found anything quite as explicit as this recent um, uh, petition. And it's, I had the same feeling listening to you talk about the referendum, right? It's so in your face that this is what they're doing, right? That they are positioning themselves, uh, that Fidesz is positioning itself um, as uh, the only defender of children and giving people an opportunity to, to um, vote for the safety of children and who wouldn't vote for that and for the only defender that presents uh, themselves as available, and that's the elections part. So, so it's almost like all our in intricate, mm, uh, you know, interpretive job is almost in unnecessary because it's now it's so in, in your face. Uh, so thanks for that. Um, it, I'm, I'm really grateful for your rephrasing of the, of the basic opposition in place here, that it's an opposition between sanity and insanity. Um, I think we, we are so attached to our own reading of this phenomenon as a populist phenomenon. In other words, to mm, putting to reframing everything we find um, into what we already know, which is that it's always elites against ordinary people and the elites are always corrupt and the ordinary people are always innocent and normal. That I, I it just, it just came to my mind that actually the sanity versus insanity is really important because it also creates this opening in Poland and Hungary uh, to the next step. And I, I wonder if that might be the fifth question, the implicit fifth question in the referendum, which is, uh, would you like to leave this crazy place called the European Union? Uh, and I'm thinking, you know, hung Hungarian exit and Pol exit uh, are really being prepared through this discourse of European insanity, European perversion, Europe as a threat to our children. You know, at some point you just can't stand it any longer. Your children are being persecuted by, by German trans 
transvestites and so you just leave and after five years of preparing the ground it seems like the only sane thing to do um i completely agree with you that race um plays a key role and i think we we did write about it maybe not enough that the that the distribution of um uh, the the uh, money to families is different in Hungary and that the maybe Elzbieta can say more about this welfare chauvinism does have a racist face in, in especially in countries where where race matters more than it does in Poland um, as for um, the Hungarian lack of mobilization uh, we find it puzzling and we would like you to respond actually to your own question you know what is it about Hungary uh, maybe my guess is that authoritarianism came so quickly that there was no time for mobilization on either side. In other words, it was all prefabricated. Um, and uh, I don't know if it's in the book or in some other text that we're writing. Um, we came up with this idea that, um, is it Katalin uh, Novak, um, the Hungarian minister for, um, uh, what is she a minister for? Is it ed education? Youth and um, family, of all family. Yeah, and family that she actually embodies our idea of um, uh, of, of collaboration between these two forces almost uncomfortably so because uh, we we really insist throughout the book that these are two different forces the anti gender movement is one and the politicians are the other and here you have the a politician without a and the, there is no movement really you have a politician who actually has joined the relevant anti-gender groups and of course um orban was one of the first um politicians to join the anti-gender movement as a speaker uh, when the world congress of families took place in, in hungary so yeah hungary is a puzzle and i think we may be oversimplifying things with regard to hungary um so thank you very much for those comments um yeah and i guess speaking to gaudencius i I completely share your sense of urgency and um, your sense that this goes much deeper than just gender, that gender is actually a stand in for cultural change, for moder modernity, for the ability to think uh, bravely. And that um, insofar as the anti-gender discourse is, anti is essentialist, it's not just about gender, it's about the social construction of anything and everything. They want everything to be, mm, the, everything about social life and human life to be preordained by God. So their essentialism is actually a kind of religious fanaticism at its core. Although we trace the ways in which this movement pretends to be a secular one, I think it may be less visible in Brazil. I think in Brazil, it may be more in your face religious uh, dogma than in places like France, Italy, and so on. Um, and I completely agree with you that censorship and self-censorship are the real demons here, that we're talking about um, a movement that has managed to intimidate people, uh, to terrorize institutions of learning and to produce their own institutions of pseudo learning institutions that pretend to be um, academic institutions. So yes, they, they are ushering in um, uh, you know, a new era that I don't want to call it the Middle Ages because I think the Middle Ages were far more interesting than, than the cultural project they're actually planning for, for us all. So thank you very much for reminding us that what's really at stake here is democracy. I would just add that uh, this issue with uh, exclusionary practices, uh, combined with the promise of uh, support for all families is very visible, I would say, in the Polish context as well. And it has become very visible, especially um, during the last couple of months when we had a, a migrant crisis, refugee crisis at the Belarusian border. And one of the uh, attempts on the, on the part of um, organizations helping the refugees who are, who are stranded in the, in the forests uh, near the border and who are cruelly pushed back totally illegally, in fact, by, by the, uh, by the uh, National Guard and by the police was to show children, actual children who were there and who have been basically dying in this condition, in these conditions, and nobody cared about that. I mean, if you if you look at you know all those organizations who are supporting the children, saving the children, protecting the children, they didn't say a, a word about actual children, you know, being stranded in the woods without 
uh, without help, uh, medical support, or or uh, or access to to shelter. So in that sense, it's a, it's absolutely exclusionary vision of our children. It's not a coincidence that all those children who are depicted on the visual materials are those you know nice blonde, blue eyed, sort of. Aryan type of children that that you know Nazi propaganda would also like to use probably. So in that sense, um, in the Polish context, we see it in in um, probably in different spheres, um, and it has become very visible because of the of the crisis at the border. But at the same time, if you think about the ways in which the Polish state um, deprives uh, same sex parents uh, from the possibility to first of all have children and then if they have children abroad to register them um, and by illegally the, the, uh, basically uh, canceling the, possi the possibility to register those children as Polish uh, citizens, it's part of this dynamic. It's just, you know, who, who are the ones who, who are branded as others, as those who do not belong to this very um, a very narrow nationalistic definition of us, the people. And I also would like to, to comment off what Gaudencio said, and I think that I will very much uh, agree with you about the fact that this is a very, very um, um, ambitious project, I would say, about, uh, about uh, creating a new type of knowledges, a new type of legitimacy for expertise, for expert bodies, for scholars. And it is not a coincidence that the new um, institution of higher learning, a private university, which was established this year by Ordo Iuris, with the financial and organizational help of the Polish state, called Collegium Intermarium, has been and is still promoted uh, with the slogan, the Free University of Central Europe. So obviously the idea is that, oh, CEU has basically gone. So now we will be promoting through, um, through expertise, uh, through, um, through science, which is finally free from the constraints of, um, of um, uh, gender ideology and, um, and um, political correctness. So it's, it's a very, I, I wouldn't say that it's very successful yet, but clearly <laughs> there, is, there is a sense that um, not only as in Poland and as in many other countries, it is not a coincidence that the uh, universities and institutions of higher learning and uh, cultural institutions have been uh, one of the main um, targets for these attacks, attacks and attempts to take over, uh, but because the, the 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 ultimate goal is to change the the very structures and the very ideas of how can we produce knowledge, who should do it, under what uh, conditions, and with what um, what um, 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 basically in, in what ways can we think about knowledge and expertise as legitimate and and validate and valid. Sorry. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, I um, want to first of all remind uh, the audience that if they would like to comment or question uh, uh, the discussants or, or the panelists, uh, they should do so through the question and answer function. And I, I will be uh, monitoring that. But before I bring, and I'm going to wait for uh, comments uh, and questions to be uh, to, to come forth, and I will then uh, pose them to uh, the panelists. Uh, but before I do so, I want to actually um, um, kind of underscore something that uh, Ava uh, pointed to, but didn't elaborate on, and I would like uh, Elżbieta and Agnieszka to uh, develop this. This is a really interesting book because it's uh, very well uh, researched and documented. It has very clear analytic focus. Uh, and also, despite the very dismal phenomena that they're analyzing, it's a hopeful book. Uh, uh, having to do with an understanding that, a that, that we have to understand uh, what this threat is. And we also have to understand ways that we can mobilize against the threat. And they use some Polish cases particularly to uh, 
um, um, kind of analyze that. It seems to all revolve around a critique, a, 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 a sense that the that neoliberalism is uh, being uh, rejected not only by the left, but now we have to really realize that it's being forcefully rejected by the right. Uh, uh, and I'll just say to add, a, add an American note, kind of changes in, in the American conservative scene is such that, uh, and it's connected to Donald Trump and the supporters of Donald Trump, that neoliberalism and, and the right are not as intimately connected as they, they used to be. So the contrast between Europe and, and uh, the United States is really not as strong as even you present it in your book, and you know that. So this, I'm not bringing any special news. But, but the, 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 uh, the way you analyze, and I, I also have to say something, I don't want to start giving a speech, but I also have to say that I'm skeptical about the term neoliberalism. And, and, uh, um, and if as we proceed, you can kind of uh, 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 convince me that my skepticism is mistaken, uh, uh, I'd appreciate that. I mean, I think it, it, it uh, kind of, uh, it, it, it refers to too many different things and, it, and it's objectified in, uh, in ways that um, I find um, questionable, but let's not focus on that. What I would like really for you to respond to is this, you know, the basis of hope. The, the the capacities for mobilization that uh, that you see and you analyze uh, in, in, in the text. Thanks for that. Um, yes, I, I'll skip the uh, neoliberalism part. I'm just a cultural Please. studies person, and you know I'm not particularly attached to this world uh, to this word. Um, I'm happy with uh, the present stage of capitalism, and you know references to Jameson or or Fisher, if you will. Um, right. But uh, as for hope, uh, you know we've been on quite a roller coaster in the last two years after we finished uh, writing our book. The largest demonstrations in Poland's history exploded. Um, in uh, I think we we managed to add a few sentences about those in the Polish edition of the book. And let me just show you the 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 um, the cover. It just came out um, a few weeks ago, and it's actually a funny cover that I think Audencia will like because it shows it's humorous and it shows the that um, what's going on here is a holy war. Right, you have you have a saint fighting with a dragon of gender on the cover. We're very um, grateful uh, for, for for this cover. Um, so as for hope, um, we have seen um, mobilizations that exceeded our um, wildest dreams. We've been in you know in the business of trying to mobilize women for feminist causes and uh, it, for twenty years, and you know we've attended feminist uh, marches that attracted. 300 people and suddenly there are mar marches and demonstrations in the midst of the pandemic that attract 100,000 people, both men and women and lots of different genders in between. And uh, we have we have uh, heard from critics who say, well, but this movement is impotent, but this movement is incapable of, uh, of creating real change. It also hasn't really institutionalized or it ha and it hasn't been very effective in uh, exerting uh, pressure on um, politicians. But the hope is in the fact that there is this new generation, um, and we're talking high school students through, you know, university students, age people, for whom gender, um, broadly speaking, has become a symbol of freedom. In other words, they're not they're not buying it. They're really not buying this idea that um, uh, free thing, free thinking and um, and a sense of um, inner freedom in the realm of gender is a danger to children or or anyone else. The, 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 one of my favorite slogans of these demonstrations is, "I've got gender and I won't be afraid of to use it." And in fact, uh, you know. The, the 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 hope is also in the humor of a lot of the the cultural reactions to these phenomena. You know, we're dealing with people who believe that we are demons, and then these high school kids come to our rescue um, by staging these completely outrageous theatrical um, performances. You know, in the midst of you know of December, uh, you know, dancing in the streets. I I don't know about other countries, but I think polls just won't buy it. It's there, there's too much will will to freedom 
around. And it has been um, consolidated around the idea of gender equality and uh, especially women's reproductive rights. So yes, we're in a terrible place. You know, abortion is banned. Women are completely banned. Women are dying in hospitals. Um, LGBTQ people are really in a, in a dark place as well. But, but, but there is this sense of outrage, which is really widespread. Um, so I think that, the, you know, the reaction to the reactionary phenomenon is, is hugely widespread. And that's, you know, that's where I find hope. What I find particularly interesting, and I hope we can have a conversation, I, what I find particularly interesting is that the Poland that I researched, um, you know, 40 years ago, 30 years ago, 20 years ago, uh, actually standing up against the Catholic Church was um, almost unimaginable. You know, if you were against the Catholic Church, you, you were essentially quiet. Um, uh, uh, and uh, as far as real change, I think these mobiliz this mobilization is kind of uh, connected to and maybe even uh, instigating some fundamental rethinking of um, Polist right, right wing ideology. Uh, which centers around the church, so that people are disaffected from the church. This is really uh, a major change uh, uh, in Polish political culture, which, uh, and I think that it's enduring, you know, uh, and I have uh, um, a, a very progressive Jesuit Catholic priest, former student, who, who thinks that Poland is on the road to Ireland, that, that, that the authority of the church and the population is just very, very rapidly diminishing. And I think that these demonstrations are manifestations of that and also crystallizations of that. So the argument that, that this is somehow marginal and, and um, you know, a playground off on the side and you know, having no consequences, I think that the, uh, the, there's re a real uh, uh, um, manifestation of, of its uh, uh, high level of, co uh, of consequence. If I may add on that, because I, I think that the Catholic Church is, is a very important element of this whole structure, because I think that the many discussions about Poland and also other countries are premised on the belief that uh, the, 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 the power of the Catholic Church in terms of politics and society is connected to actual level of how many people are believers, right? So it's rooted in the people's support. Whereas in the Polish context, I mean, and also in many other countries, I would say, you can see how uh, the church as a, a political institution is losing, uh, is losing uh, its supporters, is losing believers, but that makes uh, religious institutions even more prone to uh, uh, collaborate very closely with specific political forces, political uh, groups. And Russia is probably another interesting example in, in this respect, um, uh, in which uh, uh, where you can see how the needs and, and beliefs and the sense of you know, who has the authority, especially among younger generation, diverges hugely from what is represented in the political scene, right? In this kind of connection between the church, religious authorities, and right wing or uh, or conservative politicians, and I think that uh, I, I don't, as a sociologist, I don't believe in inevitable inevitability. I think that's the word that I was looking for. So, in the sense that you know, there is no later linear development that is meant to be in any sense, uh, but I do believe um, in the fact that. Uh, if certain institutions, such as Catholic Church, lose authority in this rebellion sense, you know, the, the agreement uh, of the legitimacy of the people who support the, the rule of this institution uh, as representing uh, the, the specific, uh, you know, norms, values, and, and practices, uh, there is no way out in a sense. I mean, you can't uh, force them, you know, you can't force those young people to, uh, to believe in church. I'm not talking about believing in God, to believe in church as an institution that should organize um, social life. Um, but the problem is, of course, that, uh, and I think that this is the question of hope, that um, the question is like, are these two on the collision course? 
I mean, the, the secularizing, more progressive um, sections of the society and the society at large, which becomes in the Polish case, but also in many, many other countries, more secular, more progressive. And the elites, which are extremely devoted to promoting this, this uh, I would say, socially conservative populist uh, program or agenda, are they on the collusion course? And if yes, what will be the, the outcome of this collusion? Because I think that what we see in America and in Poland and in other, many other countries, and Hungary again is, is I would say, a, a, a divergent case here, is the fact that uh, politicians try to play not to attract you know, the, the center, I mean, the, the people who are so who believe that, uh, they are the moderate or see, uh, see themselves as moderate, uh, but they want to mobilize um, a minority but the minority, which is you know powerful enough, resourceful enough, determined enough to be able to actually size, size power, and that's that's the, these two processes, which are you know social political, I would say, um, uh, my result in well a future that is very difficult to predict. Although personally, I hope that uh, that there is a sense of you know change in the air, but uh, and that it is a swan song of of this version of ultra conservatism, which really tries to preserve itself in its in its sort of um, old form, and I think that this conflict that we see now it's 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 the the sort of last accords of of this struggle. If I may just briefly intervene, um, I'd, I'd like to speak to Jeffrey uh, Goldfarb's comment on the role of the church. I understand that you visited Poland in the 80s, I think that was your even, um, even in the 70s. Even in the 70s. And I know that you're friends with Michnik. Yes. Our book was recently compared uh, somewhat um, jokingly to Michnik's famous work, uh, Kościół Lewica Dialog, the, the, the Church, the Left Dialogue. This was a very important book published in the mid 70s. Um, diagnosing the need for the democratic opposition to enter into an alliance with the progressive part of the church so that dialogue can ensue and the ground can be prepared for a future democratic Poland. I think that's a fair representation of this idea, which was a, a very powerful idea for, for two decades at least. Well, I think our book could be called uh, The Church, The Right, The End of Dialogue. Mm -hmm. That, and so the, 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 the way that the game, the game in town has changed is that, first of all, there is no progressive wing of the church. And some people will tell you, well, there used to be, but now it's gone. And some people will say, well, we are now rewriting the history of the 80s, uh, looking a little bit more closely at what was going on in the Vatican at the time, right? Not just through our then infatuation with John Paul II, but with what we actually know about the Vatican in that period. And it's an, an, an enormous conservatism and also what was going on around pedophilia, which people were completely unaware of. Um, um, uh, so that's that's one thing that but but the other thing is that the church has really turned around and joined into a very visible coalition with authoritarian um, uh, parties. The church is no longer um, and doesn't even try to present itself a defender of Poland's democratic future. That's that era is gone, and that kind of releases uh, young people in Poland uh, to be enemies of the church. Because you know what you were observing in the '80s is that people, everybody went to church, including atheists. I mean, I'm a Jew who was who was raised as a Catholic because that was what you did with your kid, right? You sent your children to Catholic institutions to prevent them from being um, from becoming communists. Um, that era is gone. Something has really changed. So thanks for that observation. I'm I'm glad that uh, you know that it's visible from the outside. It is I, it is I, a watershed. I would love if you wrote. Uh, an essay exactly uh, under that title. I, I, I think it would be really, really interesting. Uh, you know, and I, I, I'm an entrepreneur for the Democracy Seminar. We're co-sponsoring this. I'd love to read that article, uh, I have to say. I, 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 I think, and of course, Michnik uh, doesn't, I, I don't know everything that he's thinking now, but, he, but he, he, his position has changed significantly as well not no oh, maybe maybe not significantly it doesn't doesn't really matter yeah you he know, gave I, an interview in which he defended the church um just a few months ago 
which was well, pretty uh, widely ridiculed, unfortunately. Uh, well, uh, s uh, too bad. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I didn't read that. Uh, I, I'd like to bring the panelists' uh, attention to the and everyone else's attention to the question and answer. Uh, uh, Bryn uh, Tanhill uh, has uh, posed a number of different questions, uh, including uh, hope is not a strategy. Uh, consider the old military idiom attributed to, to uh, 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 Eisenhower. Uh, uh, you know, really, is there actually any actionable items uh, to stop the anti-general gender movement? Uh, 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 do the protests produce change? I, I, I think we started answering that, saying that that there, there's a very significant change of uh, public opinion. But uh, um, but you know, if you look, if you he's skeptical about uh, let's say the premise of our discussion in the past few minutes, and uh, uh, maybe you want to address uh, that skepticism. Or does anyone want to address that skepticism? Well, yeah, uh, there's several questions. So I'm not sure if I will be able to, to uh, answer all, because obviously the question about Alexander Dugin's and his idea that, you know, uh, Russia can use cultural issues or that cultural culture war to expand its uh, uh, sphere of inf influence, it's, it, it is a tactic <laughs> of, the, of, the, of Putin and, and uh, his... Uh, colleagues, so uh, obviously this is something which has been very much um, um, we could very much observe in the case of you know promoting the idea of uh, of the West as uh, some as a, as a place that is deeply affected by moral degeneracy and by all the social ills that are connected to that. And of course, the question is to what extent certain elements, and now there is this, um, this notion of um, conflicts within the feminist movements around, I don't know, trans issues and other issues, which are also sometimes attributed to influences, uh, or at least the scale of those conflicts is uh, are uh, partly attributed to the influences of, uh, let's say, agents of change or people who want to become this kind of um, entrepreneurs and who are uh, in fact um, uh, paid or or um, uh, supported by Putin's Russia. So, so that's a well-known fact. So, I guess we can only. Um, agree with that. Uh, but uh, I'm also thinking about the question of change. Um, I wouldn't, I mean, Poland has uh, been termed in 2021, the fastest uh, authoritizing country in, in Europe, I, I, as far as I remember. But I would say that we are not, um, uh, um, uh, you know, fully um, autocratic regime yet. Hopefully, and of course, we will we will see to what extent uh, we still have the possibility to intervene through democratic procedures and structures in two years' time during the elections. But um, the question is always, uh, what do we mean when we think about change? Because when we think about um, people's attitudes, views, and practices as well, the change is very visible. But the problem is that because of the close uh, channels of communication and cooperation between civil society and the state, between society and the, and the state, and the governing party, this change is very difficult to translate into, for example, policy, right? So, and therefore, uh, the state introduces this kind of fast track policy uh, procedures, which means that on average, um, uh, new uh, bills, new uh, law projects are debated in the Polish parliament for less than two weeks, right? And many of them are of major importance in terms of um, judiciary or media or education and so on. Um, so, in that sense, um, um, I would say that if we uh, believe that cultural change and social change and the change in people's beliefs and uh, and attitudes and practices is a prerequisite to uh, political change. We uh, we might be uh, quite sure that this change will uh, will um, take place. But of course, the question is: to what extent can we still believe in fair elections? To what extent can we still believe in the sort of machinery of democracy to be able to 
um, to be actually, actually absorb um, the change that is happening. And to this, I don't have a clear answer. Answer, and I don't think anyone has. I don't know if. Um... Yeah, I'd, li I'd like to speak to this provocative claim that hope is not a strategy. Of course, it isn't. Uh, we were asked about hope. Uh, we are, uh, I think, a little bit less optimistic about strategy. And so I can I can list what I see as three obstacles to a successful um, counter movement to uh, the anti-gender movement. One is what Elzbieta was saying, that this is not a spontaneous movement uh, building its power from the grassroots, although the grassroots do exist. And we devote quite a bit of time in our book discussing on why, why real people are drawn into these ideologies. But the real power of this movement comes from its collabor successful collaboration with uh, authoritarian governments. So where you do have these parties in power, that movement is not going to be stopped unless the, the government is stopped. And this brings us to the second uh, reason why I'm skeptical is that the opposition parties, which uh, those opposition parties, which might integrate, which might build a coalition mm, to, to um, oust law and justice in Poland and I guess Fidesz in, uh, in Hungary similarly, are not really committed to defending LGBTQ rights or women's rights. They, they, I think they have been successfully intimidated by this idea that mm, gender equality is a threat to children and they wouldn't want to be positioned in the role of um, supporters of perverts. It's a very powerful um, strategy. And I think uh, in Poland anyway, the opposition has succumbed to it. Uh, so you have, uh, so, so the opposition is just not doing its job in this regard. They continue to treat gender as a side issue, as a distractor, as something that can be put on the back burner. And the, the third reason for skepticism is that this wonderful movement, uh, which has brought hundreds of thousands of young people into the streets, has failed to successfully institutionalize. And why that's the case, I think, you know, we, we have our guesses, we don't know, you know, we have our hopes, but it's a fact. Um, there has been enough time to, to, to create these lasting institutions and modes of communication, and it hasn't happened. So, so that worries us and we're not going to spread, you know, propaganda of success because we're not quite confident in it. Yeah, that, 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 that's a problem um, given the kind of media, um, um, media forms that we have for rapid mobilization now. Uh, this is a problem not only with this movement, but actually with many uh, uh, democratic movements uh, across the globe. That that, that uh, and it reminds us actually that uh, institutions like political parties, uh, um, strong political parties, are still very very important, and uh, um, and well and unfortunately uh, for for the same reasons not present. You know that that they they become uh, machines of, of you know infiltrated by. Uh, uh, the social media, and, and of course, you know, in a great case in point is the United States. Do you uh, think there is a cause and effect relationship here? In other words, the so the role of social media in mass mobilization actually prevents institution building. I I, I think it may it, easy mobilization. Uh, 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 you know, in general, first of all, I think that we don't live in a world. Our world is saturated with social media, so that uh, there's really no social world apart from social media. So, so to imagine that here we are and there is social media is a kind of conceptual mistake. Uh, sociologist of media speaking right now, uh, but 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 I think that that it's uh, easy to mobilize uh, uh, means that we don't do the kind of nitty gritty work that we used to have to do to connect with each other. And therefore, we don't have the patterns of, you know, that we haven't institutionalized the patterns of our relationships that uh, enable us to act now, but also give us some capacity to act in the future. That, that, that's uh, the way I think about this. And, I, and I, you know, I, I'm curious uh, about how uh, th this uh, looks like uh, in Brazil, the, the same issues uh, uh, appear in Brazil. And uh, and this kind of uh, and, and you know we 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 uh, before we went uh, 
live, we were talking about the situation in Hungary, Hungary and Eva indicated that she uh, wasn't terribly optimistic in the moment, despite the fact that six political parties of very, very disparate uh, political convictions are actually uh, uh, have developed, I think, an incredible capacity to actually act together. Uh, um, so uh, do either of you want to uh, step in here? Um, thank you, Jeffrey. I actually would like to, um, yeah, uh, I would like to comment on something um, related to the book, of course, but also to a question that appeared on the chat that um, uh, actually asks, um, how do you square the fact of that many of these anti-gender countries, people are much less likely to regard religion as very important to their later lives, but are pursuing anti-gender goals that align with religion. So this is an interesting question because in, in, in uh, related to the case of Brazil, there is, um, I think we should, we, we have to have the, this clear because sometimes we think that these people are necessarily or should be for some reason, for some, um, for some reason affiliated with um, religion ideas. And that's not, that's not the point. The point is, for example, um, I'm going to give you the, I'm going to explain a little bit about Brazil. When we, and, and compare it to Poland, from what I know, um, in Poland, the, the, um, the role of the Catholic Church is extraordinary in its affiliate, especially considering its affiliation with right-wing and ultra conservative movements. But, and, and then we know that in Brazil, as in many countries in South America, uh, Catholicism is, is, is a major, um, most of these countries, especially Brazil, Catholicism is the major religion. It, st it still is, it has been for uh, always. But, and, but the interesting point is, Catholicism is not, the, the Catholic Church is not playing a role on this in Brazil for quite a while now. They are pretty, let's say, detached from it. And the, what, is, what, what is actually, um, the, the religion that is actually involved in this is the Neo-Pentecostal and the Pentecostal, the, 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 and the, the evangelicals. But the thing is, it's not even that simple because the difference between the, the between them that they are actually getting so involved in this is that they actually now are uh, have a huge majority in Congress, in the Senate, um, in several, uh, they are actually part of the Bolsonaro government. They, uh, Bolsonaro was elected by uh, a margin, uh, uh, in major um, advantage with the evangelical uh, vote. And they are, they are actively, actively engaged in the government. All, they are even in the Supreme Court now. There is a member uh, that was appointed by Bolsonaro that was supposed to play a role because he was, he is evangelical. And just to give you another example, the, the, the play, the, the, the role that the Pentecostals and neo Pentecostals are playing in Brazil is so extraordinary. And it has produced with their affiliation with right-wing movements and extremists um, is, is so huge that, for example, um, the ministry of, which is now, which, which used to be uh, the, the Ministry of Human Rights. It's now, it has changed by Ministry of Family, Women and Women Rights. And it is, it is um, and the minister is Damari Zalvitz and, and she's a pastor, an, an evangelical one. And she's playing, she has been playing an extraordinary role in, in pushing this agenda forward. So what I want to say basically is, well, in the case of Brazil, so there is all these contingencies and this, all these differences. And when, we, when it comes to South America, which, which, which by the way, we should never ignore, because uh, it's, if you, the case of Bolivia recently, there, you know, there was a, a coup that was uh, uh, perpetrated by evangelicals. And then never, uh, never, we should never forget Colombia, for example, in which they have been growing extraordinarily. But the case of Brazil, which is the largest country in the South, is, is really a case in point. And um, so just wrap up, we should never 
get distracted again, I, I, I use this word a lot, by the fact that these people, uh, the, the idea of that they should be affiliated with religious ideas in the, in the fact that they are in actually um, following this agenda has nothing to do with one another. So we should not expect that they should um, work together. That's what I, what I think. I think that question was very good in that respect because it, it, we should have that clear. And then, but yeah, I just wanna make this observation. Thank you. If I may add to that, because the Swedish uh, example is very interesting here, um, exemplifying the secular wing of the anti-gender uh, movement, in Sweden, the, the main public intellectuals, because I wouldn't say that there is an anti-gender movement per se, there are uh, ultra-conservative organizations, but still um, th there is this, um, th the, the arguments are very different than in the Polish context, for example, which of course is very interesting for me to observe, uh, that the main uh, accusation against gender studies, which are the, and, and gender uh, scholars, uh, or scholars doing gender and also critical race studies is that they are um they they they, they are not rational I'm, I'm looking for an english word for um uh, but it's it's like a higher church right so their accusation is that gender studies are as a is a form of quasi-religious uh, not rational, not science-based uh, mambo jumbo, which is basically promoted because of the uh, goal of, you know, acquiring a certain level of cultural hegemony. So obviously, this these different wings are very important here, and we have to be very aware of how those elements fit together and how these corporations play out. Uh, it isn't one of the fascinating things, I mean, which is one of the themes of your book, that the relationship between the anti-gender movement and, you know, the extreme right is uh, is so variable globally, so that it's very, very important to then specify how it works. And, uh, um, you know, I, I, I find that fascinating, that, that, that um, religion plays a, an important role. Uh, but um, uh, how it plays an important role varies uh, immensely. A, 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 and also secularism or anti-religion plays mm -hmm. uh, such a role. Agnieszka. Yeah, in fact, there are two countries that we looked at uh, where religion is downplayed to the point where it's almost invisible. Uh, and that's France and Sweden. Uh, in France, the Manif pour tous movement was very careful to disengage itself from radical Catholics who were among some of the founders. Um, and they were actually uh, actively courting um, at some point Muslims uh, in defense of, uh, you know, sex education free schools. Um, and in Sweden, this is more of a uh, uh, field of expertise, but we, we trace uh, an anti-gender discourse, which is very secular and which actually accuses gender studies of being a form of religion. Um, but, but I think the more exciting differences, uh, the ones that produce these bizarre images and, and contradictions have to do with race. Um, and this is a question that actually came up on the, um, in the chat and I'm quite grateful for it. Uh, the, the, the question was about homo nationalism versus right. homophobia. And that's something that took us a while to figure out. Um, and uh, the, the, what helped us understand how it works, that in uh, Poland, the, the right is, ob out, uh, is, is quite explicitly homophobic um, uh, and, and Islamophobic at the same time. And, and the two are just, you know, go parallel, but they do use homo nationalistic arguments occasionally as when addressing feminists that you want Polish women to be raped by Muslims and so on. But the, but the homophobia is right there. Whereas in, Germ uh, in Germany, it isn't. In Germany, you, you have the a AFD party, which for quite a while was headed by an o by an out lesbian, and they were proud of it. And they were using homo nationalist arguments, um, it, which were also Islamophobic. The, how does it work? We were trying to figure out. And the answer is actually in the title of our book. It works through the word gender. In Poland, the word gender clearly includes gays and lesbians. But in Germany, you can be an anti-gender gay person. 
gender is actually limited to the idea of uh, fluidity of gender identity. So the, 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 the genius of choosing this term, which is quite flexible uh, and context dependent for an enemy, uh, is that it actually can work in different ways in different contexts, depending, depending on you know, the levels of actual homophobia. Um, in Poland, gender includes abortion, for instance. I don't think in France it does. I think in France that anyone would want to actually ban abortion would be considered crazy. But it will come. I think it expands. You know, the, the more turf they get, the, the more they will expand the meaning of the term. But it is flexible. I, I, I need, I have a question that I'm asking out of ignorance. What is homo nationalism? Elzbieta, I want to take this. Yeah, it's it's uh, both homo nationalism and femo nationalism. It's using um, um, the language of equality of women and gender and minorities in order to uh, uh, to pursue nationalistic and exclusionary agenda. So basically, homo, uh, the example of homo nationalism is. Um, the situation where right-wing parties in countries such as uh, Germany or France or, or Netherlands uh, uh, claim that um, we should uh, uh, curb um, migration, especially from Muslim countries, because the culture and the, the religious beliefs of these people, the barbarians, is incompatible with uh, our um, values and our protection of women and gays. So basically the idea is that, you know, homonationalism and femonationalism allows to, to create a border, the sort of imaginary as well as actual border between us, the, uh, the democratic, uh, progressive, enlightened West, and then the uh, sort of black and brown Muslim uh, barbarians who who want to kill our gays and you know rape our women. So th this is the the ways in which it is very much used, especially by right wing parties in in countries such as Sweden. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, I, I uh, one or two. Uh, well, there are two comments by an an anonymous attendee. I have no idea if it's the same anonymous attendee. Uh, 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 and the questions uh, kind of refer to paradoxes. And I think maybe we should explore those paradoxes a little, a little bit. Uh, um, you know, that, that uh, you know, att uh, attendee number one completely agrees uh, with you as far as uh, younger Poles have more progressive views than on gender, abortion, et cetera. Uh, and uh, uh, fewer and fewer people are identifying with Catholics, but somehow, Still, the majority of people are supporting the uh, Law and Justice Party. That's antithetical to their commitments. So, so this um, uh, the disconnect between uh, beliefs or stated beliefs and questionnaires and uh, and political action. Now, of course, it's not everyone who does who is on both sides of that, but still, there is a, there must be a significant overlap that a certain number of people are. Uh, Let's say progressive on issues of gender, uh, gender equality, and and uh, um, pro gender, and yet they still vote for uh, for the um, um, the um, the ruling party, which is very antithetical to it. And and then the set the second uh, 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 kind of paradox is uh, you know a, a, a more general one that the uh, anti-gender movement is anti-elite, pro-people, but in fact is led by elites uh, who are coordinating the movements. And how do they, I suppose the question is, how do they pull that off? Or uh, which is, I think, a perpetual uh, problem, uh, a universal problem. If I may, uh, to the first question, it's just a matter of demographics. If you look at um, the uh, people who support uh, the Law and Justice Party, the vast majority of their supporters are over 50 from rural uh, communities and so on and so forth. So uh, it's it's a question of, you know, which so, so groups... It, 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 is it like the states where those over 50 people vote more 
uh, regularly? Yes. Yes, but also it's a matter of numbers. In Poland, we have around 9 million people who are 50 plus, and we have around 1 billion people who are between 18 and 24. So it's it's the demographics, you know. We are we have one of the lowest fertility rates for years now, on decades or decades actually, and uh, and uh, even when the young people are extremely, um, you know, um, um, mobilized and they vote in record numbers, they are not able to actually have as much an impact on politics in terms of you know voting and the, and the, uh, another question is about anti elitism i think that that's that's something that we wanted to uh, that we discuss in details in the book but that's that's exactly why they need because they are the elites themselves that's why they need to vilify specific groups as dangerous elites so that's why the need to uh, reverse the the, uh, the victim perpetrator roles and to position groups which are actually minority groups and who don't have elite position and didn't have elite positions also before 2015, uh, such, a, such as LGBTQ um, community or, or women's activists, feminists, and so on. So in that sense, um, you don't always need to uh, to actually, you know, um, have uh, in a sense that the the the, uh, the tendency to moralize the political divide answers this question. So the the issue is no longer about who has power or disproportionate, disproportionate access to power or resources, is about who is evil. Right. So when you moralize this divide, much in in the sense that Mueller, for example, uh, proposed, uh, then you are not talking about the actual division of power between different groups, but you are talking about the money can uh, um, fight between evil and and good, and that's why I would say. Um, uh, uh, right wing populists, when they are in power, they are so. Uh, attracted to anti-gender uh, discourse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that was very well explained. I can only add that uh, you could apply your question. I don't know what country the, uh, the, the person asking is from, but you can ask this question about Trump. How yes. did this millionaire, you know, with a weird hairdo manage to convince millions of Americans that he's actually a champion of the ordinary man. And the answer is very complex and there are lots of people, uh, you know, on it, onto it. Um, I, I really like the explanation uh, offered by Arlie Hochschild, uh, you know, talking about how he managed to mobilize resentments, which were already there, how he managed to um, feed on shame, a, a kind of desire for recognition um, and spread the sense of, uh, and, 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 and and also spread um, opposition within the within the society, the kind of um, hatred of of the elites. So, you know, populism is not about the the, the rising people who, who create their own uh, way of doing politics. It's about politicians creating a viable notion of the people and positioning themselves as defenders and champions of the people. Mm. Yeah, I, I I think that you um, kind of interestingly analyze that in in uh in the book itself the the the, the way um the, the the kind of elements of anti-gender ideology actually creates a constituency which that which then has power uh i i think that that's that's very very interesting so as i look i have not been very good at reviewing the chat simultaneously with the question and answer but i think that I uh, have more or less covered the question and answer that we have discussed them. And I hope I haven't missed anything important that comes from the chat. Uh, I, maybe I'll give people uh, a, 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 you know, two minutes if they want to actually register anything on the question and answer. And uh, as I ask uh, the, uh, as I thank you both, uh, uh, all, all three of you, and unfortunately Eva had to leave, as she indicated in the chat, uh, for a really interesting conversation. Uh, I, I, 
uh, I wonder if you have any uh, final comment. You want, anyone has any final comment that, that uh, uh, they want to make? Uh, now's the time, Elgibeta, please. Actually, there was this very interesting question uh, from Delina Fico in the in the chat about any potential I'm... meeting points between the gender equality movement and the anti-gender movement. Um, and I would say that, um, well, if we think about the movement in, in a sense, anti-gender movement in terms of the leaders, politicians, people who are, you know, norm entrepreneurs, I don't think that there is a possibility for conversation. And I'm speaking also from my own experience of, of a person who were attending these events and who have been interviewing some of those people at least, or trying to. Um, but I think that there are potential elements which are similar uh, in terms of, for example, the, the ways in which uh, both groups critique sort of um, the hijacking of uh, feminism or um, women's movement by neoliberalism. It, 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 we also discuss it in the book. There is this very interesting overlapping. Of course, the ways in which this is uh, described and the, the potential outcomes are you know, very different, but, but there is an interesting overlap. And I also think, and this is something which we have been talking, with, uh, talking about with Agnieszka for a long time, there is definitely a, an overlap between the issues addressed by the women's movement and the issues which people are anxious about, about or worried about uh, and which drives them to or which attracts them to uh, the anti-gender movement, which is, for example, the question of motherhood and the question of the, uh, you know, the, 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 the crisis of care. Um, and in these I, two I, issues, I think care is really central. The, the, the... Exactly. So in that sense, uh, I mean, we, we, I think that we as people who are engaged in progressive movements have to repeat ourselves and others again and again and again, that these issues, and especially the, the issue of care, is of key importance. And it is, if, if, we'd want, if we want this issue to stop being the entry point for uh, engagement in conservative movements, we have to own it ourselves. Yeah, yeah. See, see you were very critical of Michnik's uh, classic uh, book, uh, The Church to the, the Left Dialogue, and I, I understand why. But one thing that that book accomplished is that it was able to create um, a kind of a center of uh, oppositional activity that enabled people who, who thought differently about lots of things to understand that they have to work together. And I think that what Elzbieta has just said highlights the fact that the challenge of our time is actually to create a similar zone of dialogue, maybe around the issue of care that um, uh, uh, re resonates not only with people who, with whom we agree with on everything, but also people who um, um, uh, view, um, let's say, radical intellectuals with, with a great deal of suspicion. So I, I mean, I, th I think the, the brilliant move of Michnik is that he was able to articulate such a center uh, of opposition back then. It's not the center right now, but the, the, the project I think is really, really important. And I think that uh, this um, kind of element of your book uh, uh, points in the direction that, 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 that this could go. Uh, so um, I celebrate you for that. And, uh, you know, I, as I said, I'd really like to, to uh, uh, you know, this update uh, of Meethnik's uh, 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 book as an essay I would love to read. Uh, I, I, I might even be in, interested in collaborating with someone who, who would be uh, uh, want to do uh, write such a text. So um, I think that's it. I, although I hate having the last word. So, so please, one, someone else have the last word. Go. <laughs> I'm always ready to have the last word. Um, yeah, I'm. You know, I was raised in the '80s uh, on the myth of, uh, or the reality of the dissident movement. I'm, you know, I'm respectful, and Michnik is one of my heroes. What I think has changed really um, is the, the 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 central motivation of the Catholic Church, and the influence of these uh, really fascist movements. 
uh, which have gotten out of hand. And I think Brazil is really interesting in that, uh, yes, they're Pentecostals, but they're also, there's also tradition fam family property, which is a global movement right now, which the church has a tremendous problem with. Um, uh, and these movements um, have abandoned the project of democracy completely. They have abandoned the project of what, you know, people like Havel and Michnik thought of as decency. Where I would locate my hope, um, besides this idea of, of the crisis of care as something that needs to be discussed, um, is also what is left of progressive religious movements. Um, maybe not in Poland so much, uh, but you know I'm actually going to a um, um, conference in Oslo uh, in, the, in the theology department with, you know, where most of the talks are on religion. And I think there's still, you know, religion is not dead. And this radical version of religion is also not entirely victorious. There are lots of people in the middle who are kind of lost and looking for some discourse that will satisfy their need for community meaning, but also freedom of expression. Uh, so I'm hoping that uh, our book will be read by some of these people and some, you know, dialogue will will ensue. I think, you know, there might be people out there who we're not aware of, who are worried about the the, the state of things. But I wouldn't locate my my hope in Michnik anymore. I'm sorry. Yeah, sure. Well, I, 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 we shouldn't. I, another aspect of your book that I really appreciated, mm -hmm. though, uh, was how you're highlighting that the present movement is less uh, um, kind of crystallized around heroes and more uh, a, 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 a manifestation of uh, um, kind of collective action or uh, group action. Uh, I'll just add. Uh, when I was observing the solidarity movement above ground and underground, it always struck me that it, it was a collaborative project and it was only the way it was reported that it turned out to be characterized as an activity of heroes. But th th I can't help myself, I have to say that. But, but um, you know, what I really appreciate about the book is that the kinds of discussions that uh, you're hoping to provoke is that in fact you have you do provoke, and uh, as a kind of collaborative act, I'll say that I'd be very very happy in uh, not only introducing the discussion. I'm not only happy that I introduced the, we introduced the discussion of this at the democracy seminar today, but I look forward actually to our working together to uh, further this uh, this discussion. So uh, I'm going to bug you. Uh, to uh, uh, kind of continue working with us. So uh, with that in mind, really, thank you very much. Uh, thank, uh, 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 thank you, Lala, as always, for making this possible. Uh, thanks to all the, the uh, uh, members of the audience who have stuck with us. Uh, this was a fascinating discussion, and I hope uh, the beginnings of something uh, exciting that we can do together. And I'm, I'm seeing in the chat that many people are uh, seconding my motion. So uh, I hate th this aspect of uh, Zoom webinars because it always seems strange. How do you stop this? I, all I have to do is click a button and it's over, but I, I will yeah. <laughs> thank you all and click the button and Thank it you will so be much. Over.